Thank you, Matt. My, uh, I'm happy to announce that my writing name, which by the way, this, we have uh, a speaker and three deputy speakers to some comments, and three of the four of them have gotten it wrong. Uh, Matt's uh, incorrect version is the most common mistake, but there are others. Uh, I'm happy to announce that after the next election, my writing uh, name shrinks to Leonard Frontenac Kingston, so that's progress. Um, I'm here to talk today about an idea that um, I think could help to make a significant difference with regard to property rights in Canada. It's the idea of entrenching property rights in the Charter one province at a time by means of the Section 43 amending formula. The Canadian Constitution has, it's, it's actually unique among constitutions uh, of federations around the world, and that instead of having one amending formula, in the United States, for example, you have uh, uh, two thirds of uh, members of each of the two houses of Congress, plus the legislatures of three fourths of the states enact an amendment and it becomes a change to the Constitution. That works for everything. The Swiss have a system, the Australians have an amending formula. We have five amending formulae. One of which contains Section 43 of the Constitution Act 1982 uh, allows for amendments to be made uh, that affect one province only and uh, that are enacted when Parliament plus the legislature of the relevant province adopts that amendment. My suggestion, Jim's suggestion as well, is that this can be done for individual provinces that feel they would like to protect property rights more fully than is currently done now. The property rights amendment that uh, so this idea originated back in the early 2000s, um, and in 2011, uh, Randy Hillier, no relation to Jim, and I uh, made a joint presentation in Toronto at Queen's Park, the provincial legislature, in which we proposed the following amendment. I will now read this. This would be in addition to the Charter of Rights. And as just explained, Randy Hillier represents the same area as me in the provincial legislature, so we have overlapping electoral districts. We propose the following. Uh, the amendment would read as follows. Uh, the following section is inserted after Section 7 of the Charter of Rights. 7.1, subsection 1. In Ontario, everyone has the right not to be deprived by any act of the Legislative Assembly or by any action taken under authority of an act of the Legislative Assembly of the title, use, or enjoyment of real property or of any right attached to real property or of any improvement made to or upon real property unless made whole by means of full, just, and timely financial compensation. Subsection 2. Subsection 1 refers to any act of the Legislative Assembly made before or after the coming into force of this section. Now what I wanted to talk about today, that's, that's the proposal and one could debate the merits uh, of, of, the, uh, of the wording, but what more frequently is, has occurred has been debates over the merit of doing this at all. And there have been a number of objections to having uh, an amendment of this sort. Uh, at all. So I'm going to deal with seven objections that have been raised of various sorts. I'll just go through them as a laundry list, in what I think is a, a semi-logical order. So the first objection that I've encountered is people saying, well, why don't you just deal with real property and improvements to real estate? Why don't you deal with all property? Um, and this, I should tell you, is, is an argument that I find raised most frequently by gun owners. I have some sympathy for the plight of legal law-abiding gun owners in this country. and. Uh, uh, just recently I was uh, involved in uh, trying to get answers to some questions relating to the high-handed conduct of the RCMP in, uh, in High River uh, towards uh, law-abiding gun owners. But the reason I uh, have tried to narrow this as much as possible is because once you start expanding to deal with other forms of property, you run into two things. First of all, you deal with the fact that many forms of property in Canada are actually very well protected. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, uh, the evening before last, um, patent, copyright, trademark are very well protected. I would argue the patents uh, and copyright are probably overprotected in Canada. Uh, they don't need constitutionalized protections, which I think could turn out to be very inflexible and very problematic uh, for, for the rest of us. Um, real estate is the part, kind of property. I recognize the specific problem of, of firearms, but leaving firearms aside, 
real estate is clearly the kind of property and rights to real estate that is the most under attack in the country. It is moreover the one which is most closely associated with a clearly defined segment of the population. Effectively, rural Canadians have their wealth and their income tied to real estate. That is why they, we, are in rural areas as opposed to the downtown hubs of Calgary, Toronto, etc. So that's the first objection from my response to it. Back before I put this limit on, I used to get the kinds of objections I would get from people who were opposed to property rights. Were, well, you're going to wind up protecting the rights of Monsanto to uh, have patents over or control over uh, specific genes, which will then be used to extract wealth from me, a farmer who happens to be in the next field and has some of their spores or pollen blowing my field. That kind of argument. One person once suggested that I would be creating a situation in which the cops would be forced to turn over cocaine to drug dealers who've been arrested, and I had to point out that there's no such thing as legal property and illegal products, but that kind of objection occurs when you're dealing with something wider than real property. And seeing as real property is what is threatened in Canada, it seems to be the logical thing to focus on as much as possible. Okay, objection number two. Why are you limiting the powers of a provincial government, but not those of the federal government? And the answer to that is uh, a procedural one primarily. The powers of the federal government uh, to do anything can be limited by an amendment to the Charter of Rights. But an amendment to the Charter of Rights dealing with the federal powers must be passed using the so-called 750 formula. Seven problems of provincial legislatures representing more than 50% of Canada's population must concur in that change. That would be very difficult to obtain. Uh, this brings up uh, the issue of reopening the Constitution. Uh, that is to say, once you start looking for that 750 formula, provincial premiers come with their own issues, uh, and obviously the fears that we would reignite the kinds of problems we had during the constitutional uh, uh, attempted constitutional reforms of the Meech Lake Troutown era are, are, are very significant. There actually is a means, I think it's a legitimate means, and it's worth pursuing of restricting federal powers uh, to expropriate property or take property without compensation, and that would be through an amendment to the 1960 Bill of Rights, the uh, so-called Diefenbaker Bill of Rights, which does mention property. It says, um, in fact, I'll, I'll quote what it says in section one. Um, in Canada, there have existed and shall continue to exist without discrimination by the reason of race, national origin, color, ethnic, uh, religion, or sex, the following human rights and fundamental freedoms, namely, A, the right of the individual to life, liberty, security of the person, and enjoyment of property, and the right not to be deprived of except by due process of law, and there's a B, C, D, and E dealing with religion, freedom of speech, and so on. Well, it's there. The courts have interpreted it very, very narrowly and said essentially as long as no new and innovative uh, due process uh, considerations are stripped away, uh, anything the federal government does is legitimate, um, we could go back and strengthen that. And that would have some non-constitutional, be a quasi-constitutional protection for property rights at the federal level. It would not require provincial consent. That's not this initiative, and I won't speak any more about it, but that is how I would propose handling that at the federal level, or vis-a-vis -vis the federal government's powers. The third objection that's been raised is that uh, the kind of thing that Jim is proposing to do in Alberta, and that I propose to do in Ontario, is an intrusion into provincial affairs. And such a, a motion ought to originate in the Alberta legislature or the Ontario legislature, as the case may be, uh, rather than in the House of Commons. I think there are a number of responses, and Jim's going to deal with this more than I am, but I'll just state uh, the, the first thing, which is I think you should be highly suspicious. I am highly suspicious of any argument that says that even raising a question, even initiating the legislation is uh, beyond the pale for some reason of good form or manners. That there's some kind of unstated rule of good behavior that restricts you in ways that go beyond uh, uh, what the actual law and constitution say. I think that is a fine thing to have conventions that restrict the executive power. When we see make-believe conventions invented to restrict uh, the activity of democracy, that is reason for us to be suspicious and say we reject those conventions. But I will state this. Um, there is uh, considerable interest in this subject matter in the Alberta legislature. There was interest in the Ontario legislature, not a majority, or it would have pushed for a very different way back in 2011, but I proposed the idea with Randy Hillier at Queen's Park, and uh, I think that served as sufficient demonstration that uh, this was something that 
does indeed have provincial support that bubbles up from, after all, from citizens of Ontario, in our case, Alberta, in, in this case. Uh, objection number four is that even discussing something the Constitution real is the Constitution. Uh, I think that's obviously not the case when you're dealing with an amendment that involves uh, the Section 42 amending formula. In fact, that is this is the counter to the opposite of an argument that was given earlier. I don't think there's any danger at all the real in the Constitution in the sense of creating a situation in which a whole range of new discussions are now brought on the table. Premiers come along with their concerns they want answered and so on. Um, and as a proof of how true this is, I want to point out the fact that there have been seven amendments using the Section 43 of the formula uh, enacted since 1982. This is actually used on a fairly regular basis, and each of these is handled as a standalone amendment, which does not open up a range of other discussions. And certainly not the horse trading and haggling that characterize the Beach Lake slash Charlottetown eras. All right, well, the next objection, objection number five, is that you can't amend the Charter of Rights to contain a right that applies to only the province. The Charter, after all, is, is that which governs all of us, that protects all of us. We are all Canadians, and depending on how histrionic a person is, how dare you go out there and start turning us into Canadians with different sets of rights and privileges? Isn't this terrible? Well, uh, that's a misunderstanding of how uh, how the Charter works vis-a-vis -vis individual provinces. In Canada, we don't have, unlike the United States, we don't have standalone state or provincial constitutions. In the United States, there is a constitution of the state of Massachusetts, a constitution of the state of Connecticut, and every other state has its own standalone constitution. Each constitution has a standalone Bill of Rights, which are frequently more robust in certain respects than is the federal Bill of Rights, and therefore, residents of certain states have significant additional protections vis-a-vis -vis the actions of their own state government. In Canada, we don't have that. What we have in its place is the ability to put into effect amendments to the Charter of Rights that apply to one province only, and this has been done in the past. It was done in 1993 when a new section, Section 16.1, was added to the Charter of Rights, applying exclusively to the province of New Brunswick. Section 16.1 reads, and I quote, the English linguistic community and the French linguistic community in New Brunswick have equality of status and equal rights and privileges, including the right to distinct educational institutions and such distinct cultural institutions as are necessary for the preservation and promotion of those communities. Uh, you can't tell from the wording the real purpose of this was to make sure that no one could present an equality rights argument for Section 15 of the Charter saying that the French and English school boards should be merged into a single school board. They would be kept separate. That was the, the reason for that. But the point is, it was adopted by means of resolutions of the uh, New Brunswick Legislature and the Parliament of Canada. And it applies exclusively to rights of New Brunswickers vis-a-vis -vis the New Brunswick government, which now has had its powers constrained. Objection number six is that under the standing orders of the House of Commons, it's out of order for a private member to initiate an amendment to the Constitution. This is an argument that I, I hear given by people who are unfamiliar with the Standing Orders of the House of Commons. The fact is that under the Standing Orders of the House of Commons, there are four grounds for excluding uh, a private member's bill or motion, and only four. You must violate one of these to be excluded. Item number one, it's being dealt with in a substantially similar manner in the same parliament by a different piece of legislation. You're covering ground that Parliament's already dealt with. Number two, it's a uh, an intrusion into provincial jurisdiction or it's outside of federal jurisdiction. Number three is a violation of the Charter of Rights. And uh, to be honest, I forgot what number four is, but uh, having an amendment to the Constitution does not uh, represent uh, a, a violation of any of those four rules. And uh, the proof of the pudding is the fact that I myself introduced an amendment to the Constitution on a very different subject. I proposed abolishing the power of disallowance and reservation under which the federal government can, federal cabinet, can disallow any provincial law. Back in 2005, this was debated in the House on February 15th, 2005. I have the, the answer right here. Um, it was not successfully passed. It was opposed by the NDP, the Liberals, and the Bloc Québécois for their own reasons. The Bloc's reasons were 
very strange. They said effectively, we don't want the Constitution to work effectively, and this helps make it work effectively. At any rate, <laughs> nobody said we're opposing it because it's out of order. And indeed, if you thought it was out of order, you would do so by standing up and raising a point of order with the Speaker so that the matter can be dealt with by a vote of the House on whether this subject matter is in order. None of that happened, nor would it happen in this case. And finally, Objection 7. Objection 7 is the Section 43 amending formula is not the right amending formula to use for this kind of thing, that uh, Section 43 ought not to be used. Um, another more restrictive amending formula is what is required in order to put a change like this into the Constitution. This is raised, I think, I think sincerely but wrongheadedly by people who have misunderstood the wording of the Section 43 amending formula, uh, which I will read reads as follows. An amendment to the Constitution of Canada in relation to any provision that applies to one or more but not all provinces, including A, any alteration to boundaries between provinces, and B, any amendment to any provision that relates to the use of English, or the English or the French language within a province, may be proclaimed, made by proclamation issued by the Governor General under the Great Seal of Canada, only where so authorized by a resolution of the Senate and House of Commons and of the Legislative Assembly of each province to which the amendment applies. So this, in theory, could be used for two provinces at the same time if you're changing the boundary between them. And the argument is, well, look, this is meant for boundaries between provinces. It's meant for language use and for nothing else. That is the argument that uh, gets presented. Therefore, this is, in fact, an unconstitutional proposal because you're using the wrong formula. Now, the answer to that is to take a look at Canada's uh, legislative history. I mentioned that um, seven amendments have been passed using the Section 43 amending formula since 1982, and I thought I can dispense with this as a legitimate argument simply by looking at the history of these uh, amendments. The first of them is the Constitution Act Amendment, so the Constitution Amendment 1987, which uh, amends Section 3 of the Newfoundland Act, and Term 17 of the Schedule to the Newfoundland Act, by extending education rights of the Pentecostal Church in Newfoundland. Uh, the Constitution Act uh, 1993 uh, does deal with language, but not the Constitution Amendment 1993, Prince of Rhode Island, which it amends a schedule to the Prince of Rhode Island Terms of Union, which is part of, the, uh, of our Constitution, allowing for a fixed link, a bridge, to replace the ferry service, which was actually constitutionalized in 1873 when PEI joined Confederation. Uh, in 1997, we were again amending uh, the Newfoundland Act, which is again, or Newfoundland's Term of Union, Terms of Union. Uh, this was to allow the province of Newfoundland to create a secular school system, replacing the church-based education system. There was a constitutional amendment in 1997 dealing with uh, Quebec. This does deal with language and with language rights. These are within the education system went from a Protestant and Catholic school system in Quebec to an English and French. Uh, two sets of parallel school systems. Uh, 1998, Newfoundland was back again. This time they were changing their um, uh, terms of union with Canada to end denominational quotas for their religious classes. Quotas, I think, is a reference to a funding formula. Uh, and finally, in 2001, the Newfoundlanders were back one more time and we changed the name, the Constitution, this is actually constitutionalized, the name of the province of Newfoundland was changed from province of Newfoundland to province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, I uh, addressed that uh, very question myself as a representative of, of my party in Parliament, and I'd like to think that that is the speech for which I will be remembered. Um, so now the official name of Newfoundland is Newfoundland and Labrador. The point I'm getting at here is this has been used lots for things other than language and boundaries between provinces, and therefore this objection does not stand. And I think this is true of all the significant objections to the idea of pursuing this as an initiative whatsoever. So with that, I'll stop and turn forward to Jim. Hello. Thank you, Scott. And, and I want to uh, thank Matt uh, for inviting me to speak today. This uh, topic was on the agenda, uh, I think, for quite a while, and um, he he heard through the grapevine, uh, i.e., Scott, <laughs> that uh, there was already a motion um, 
submitted to to Parliament to to amend the Constitution, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, through Section 43. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of media coverage. There wasn't any fanfare when I when I um, submitted that motion. Uh, it's not because I don't want to have any fanfare. I think to win this, we need to have a lot of public attention. Uh, I was just in the middle of a nomination race, and uh, I had to table it quickly just before um, the the summer break because I wanted it on the books before. Uh, we broke, and all that nomination is done, so now I can focus on publicizing other things, and I think we need to publicize this. Uh, Scott addressed a lot of the technical objections to this, to this uh, idea, and I'm going to address some, some of the more political objections and uh, what, what we can do to overcome those, those concerns, because Whatever we think about the shortcomings of our political system or our political state of affairs, the fact is public opinion still rules the day. And if we can get the public loudly and overwhelmingly on side with this, the, um, the political objections will have to, to give way. So I'm just going to give you a short history of why I chose this as uh, if, if you don't know, uh, members of Parliament who aren't in Cabinet have, they can, they can write up as many motions and private members' bills as they want, but they can only bring one to the floor to debate during every election period. And that's if they're lucky enough to have a low enough number in the draw that they get called before the next election. And uh, so uh, we have a choice. We can, we can pick a motion that we will, or a private member's bill that we know will pass and that way you can go into the next election saying I sponsored and, and had a bill such and so passed and that's one thing to consider. The other thing to consider is well maybe you um, chose a motion or a bill that isn't as likely to win a vote in the House of Commons but it, it might have some substance to it so it even if we don't win this vote in the House of Commons or in the provincial legislature, uh, this can change the discussion. We might even run out of time before I can, because my number is not even scheduled yet. It's um, they say I might be scheduled before the Christmas break, but may maybe not. And so we could have the next election come before we get through all the the rounds of discussion and debate and votes to make this thing pass even has support. But by making it part of the public conversation, um, it can be high on the, um, the agenda for the public in the next conversation. And so when the next parliament is, is formed, we can move this up as a priority. And so I'm okay if, even if we don't uh, make this thing pass. Since I was a little kid, as long as I can remember, I've been concerned about issues of justice. And I was born in 74, so in 1982 I was eight years old. That's uh, when we brought home the Constitution and included the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I, I don't think at eight years old I knew that property rights wasn't included. But as, as long as I can remember, I know even in junior high, I was aware of this shortcoming and disappointed in it and thought it was just a travesty of justice that um, this wasn't included in, in the in, in our charter as, as a protection and it, I was until after I graduated high school that I learned that Alberta good old true blue conservative Alberta was responsible for it not being in the Charter. And in fact, Prime Minister Trudeau was really worked to get it into the Charter. And I, it really um, shook me up a little bit. So uh, as when I was first elected in 2011 and learned that I could only get one private member's bill or motion, I really wanted to do something substantial about rights and, and human rights and and so for a couple of years now, I've been 
trying to figure out in my head, how can I sponsor a bill or motion that will get property rights codified somehow guaranteed in Canada? So we all know that the Bill of Rights uh, includes property rights. And uh, Prime Minister Stephen Baker was, he, he would have preferred that his Bill of Rights would have been a constitutional amendment and not just a, a bill, but he knew at the time that the political landscape was not, he was not going to be successful in, in making it a constitutional amendment. But he said, I'd rather have a bill than nothing. Uh, but we know that, the, that his bill that includes property rights, because it's just legislation and not a constitutional amendment, that it's been overlooked and, um, and superseded by subsequent laws, by both federal laws and, and provincial laws. And uh, we also... Uh, now, even though it's, it's, it's in the, the Bill of Rights, which is a pretty important document, and is sometimes referred to by the courts when they're reading their judgments, um, one of the, as I was discussing this with some of my provincial counterparts, because I needed to find a, a, a partner provincially, because this kind of amendment does require an identical resolution in, through the provincial legislature. So I needed to find someone or some people who are willing to, to sponsor such a resolution and, and get behind it. Uh, Gary Bickman is, uh, I grew up two doors uh, south of him, uh, went to school with two of his um, 14 kids, uh, and uh, there's something in, in the water on our street. I come from 14 kids too, and uh, two of his kids were in my class. But now he's a uh, he's my colleague, which is, and um, we were discussing this possibility, and he he's friends with with um, Lee Cutforth, the the property rights advocate of Alberta. And uh, Lee Cutforth uh, argues, and I think rightfully so, that const uh, property rights are part of our constitution through common law. And indeed, uh, we know that even though property rights aren't in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, it doesn't mean that we don't have any property rights. We, many of us own property. In fact, all of us own property, even if it's not a piece of real estate. So we do have property rights. And the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms specifically says at the beginning that if it's not in the Charter, it doesn't mean it's not a right. And, however, the fact that it's not included in the Charter has worked against property rights uh, uh, many times. In fact, in 1999, some farmers in Manitoba took the federal government to court over the wheat board and said that their property rights were being violated because they weren't able to use the fruits of their their labor or uh, their property and sell it or market it as they saw fit. And in the the text of the judgment from the Manitoba Court of Appeal in 1999, notwithstanding the fact that property rights are specifically included in the Bill of Rights, the Manitoba Court of Appeal actually said that property rights let me see, I'll get the text for it. Are not even a fundamental part of Canadian society. What? <laughs> it, even if it wasn't in the Bill of Rights, property rights are clearly a fundamental part of Canadian society. But we're becoming, even though our justice system and our, our legal system is founded on the common law system, uh, the more we go into our current age, the more we are um, funneling towards a codified system. It's got to be on the books or we, we can't fathom people governing themselves based on centuries of proven ways of doing things. We, we think that everything has to be legislated and, um, and if it ain't on the books that it's that the governments can do whatever they want. So. Um, when I was deciding how do I do this, I thought the easiest thing to do is legislation. I, I could, you know, I, I have the right to sponsor a motion or a bill 
to include property rights into the Charter of Rights and Freedoms for all of Canada, which would require the general amending formula. And even though that would be a dream come true for all of us, it is, we've had prime ministers try to use the general amending formula and fail, um, and everyone knows that that's a non-starter right now. And so I thought, even though I don't need to have a bill that is a slam dunk guaranteed win, I at least want to have a bill that will significantly contribute to the conversation. And if I chose to try to amend the entire constitution through the general amending formula, it is so remotely possible that I don't think it would get uh, serious consideration by anyone. Um, at, at best, it would be ignored. At worst, it would be ridiculed. And so I thought, well, that's not really going to help the cause. Well, the next plan then is legislation. Well, we've already got legislation, the Bill of Rights. So what possible legislation could I write that includes property rights as a, uh, as, as a codified right that isn't already in the Bill of Rights? I couldn't think of anything. And so I um, was reading the book Stealth Confisca Confiscation. Someone in here wrote that book. Well, it's being discussed in this this um, <coughs> convention, and uh, it included in one of the uh, appendices the idea brought forward by Scott Reed back in 2011 before the election of using Section 43, and it looked good to me. So that's what I decided to do, because even if we don't pass this thing, it can significantly change the conversation. And uh, the, of the objections that Scott brought up, a lot of them can wither away if public opinion um, is strong enough in favor of this. So the main political objection I think on the federal side is, and I think it's a legitimate um, objection, is if this looks like the federal government is picking a province to say we're going it's either going to look like they're picking a province to impose this upon or picking a single province to gift this upon either way it looks bad if you're just picking if the feds are just picking one and they pick well it's going to be alberta because that's where we're really strong or it's going to be alberta because they're the ones who kept it out and whatever the reason if it looks like it's driven by the feds it's not going to look good and uh, it, it won't have much chance of getting support of cabinet, I think, if it looks that way. The, uh, on the provincial side, um, whether we're looking for support from the Progressive Conservative Party or the Wild Rose Party or both, um, a large objection to this would be, from their perspective, is they don't want to, may not want to support a, uh, an amendment that binds the province, but doesn't bind the federal government. Uh, again, that I think the optics of that depends on what it looks like. It's, if it looks like it's federally driven, then I can see both parties saying, hey, wait a second, federal government. You're not gonna just thrust that on this con um, control upon us that controls the federal, the provincial government, but not the federal government. However, if it's Alberta driven, I think those arguments can wither away pretty quickly. And um, the fact that I'm, you know, I, uh, an Alberta member of parliament, um, if I, I, you know, rather than presenting this as I'm a member of the federal conservative government and I want to bring forward this motion to Alberta, um, that would not be the right approach, but me saying I'm a, a resident, born and bred, raised, living in Alberta, I represent Alberta to the federal government and my constituents and my province yearn for this amendment, I'm bringing it forth. Um, also, if, if the t timing matters, we. Uh, we, need, we can bring it to the floor provincially before federally. I don't think timing is really the problem. It's just the emphasis. So uh, we, we have um, Gary Bickman 
is willing to um, to sponsor this motion provincially. The problem is his number is really high too, and so um, he's actually if, uh, handed this over to a colleague named Rod Fox, whose number comes up sooner, so we can get it on the books sooner and get it to the floor sooner. I'm not sure of the exact dates when, when his number comes up, but it's sooner. Either way, mine's already on the books, so uh, but it hasn't been brought to debate. But it definitely needs to be a provincially um, driven cause. Now, uh, we all know that the federal government has been appointing senators that were elected by Albertans. And it's the only province for whom they do this. But it doesn't look like the federal government is only willing to appoint um, to, to accept elected senators in Alberta. They've, they've declared we're willing to do this for any province. It just so happens that Alberta is the only province who's taken this up on the offer. And I think that's the approach that we need to take. Uh, Scott just found in his little booklet here that the Saskatchewan party is talking about using Section 43 already. And so uh, we want this to look like... Um, every province can, any, any province who uses section 43, um, just pass that resolution and we'll find someone in the, in the federal government or the uh, parliament to pass a similar amendment. So um, what we need to do, I'm preaching to the choir right now, um, but the more we can talk about this and the more we can add, uh, show that this is a good idea, the, the better. The, a couple of objections that Scott did um, mention are objections that I've, I've um, heard from uh, progressive conservatives from the, the, the 1982 era. Uh, people who were in the progressive conservative party at that time, since they're responsible for keeping it out, uh, they're going to argue against bringing it back in because it's they need to save face, or maybe they really believe in it. I don't know. But one of one of the objections is that this uh, will just lead to judicial activism. If you put property rights in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, you just open the door for judicial activism towards property rights. Well. If you can imagine judicial activism around property rights where they rapidly say we should have more property rights, I think that's an okay um, problem. And uh, so I'm not too worried about that. And the other argument that, uh, that he did touch on was that this would be an application of provincial rights. Again, um, as long as it's, it doesn't change the the jurisdiction of, of who governs property, it just limits uh, some of the um, controls that government would have over property rights. Um, one last point and then I'll sit down and open it up for questions is uh, stealth confiscation and uh, you've, I think you guys talked about it yesterday one of the, the problems is our common law already acknowledges that if a government directly takes away property that they have to comp, comp, um, compensate the property owner at fair market value and, and they do so. Provinces and governments who do this, who, who take property away directly will compensate. But, um, and that's why the wording was, was chosen to not just say the right to own property, but the right to own and enjoy property. So it actually will address um, regulatory confiscation where they let you keep your property, but you can't use your property because of the regulations that they impose upon it. That specifically mentions the right to enjoy property. So if that's limited, the, uh, anyone could take that to court and expect to be compensated at fair market value for not no longer having the use of their property so uh, that's that's what's going on um, my um, my number comes up they don't know if it's at the end of uh, before Christmas or just after Christmas but it's coming up it's going to be um, on the public agenda pretty soon here and I hope we can make a lot of noise about it so that neither the provincial 
governments or the federal governments will feel very comfortable about not supporting this. So I look forward to your support and your wisdom in helping us do that. Thank you.